All right. Well, welcome again. I'm glad you're here today, and I know there's many people that are traveling this weekend uh, again, and so uh, just uh, we thankful. There's also a lot of people that are sick, um, and so I know many of you have been trying to keep up with that, so uh, just we're praying for, um, for those folks who've been in the hospital and had surgeries and who've been sick, so. All right. Um, well, today we're starting a new series uh, on Christian virtues, and the question that I want to ask is, what keeps us from having Christ-like attitudes, words, and actions? And what would free us to choose differently? This is a question that is as old as time. Uh, people have always wanted to do the right things, have desired to do the right things uh, in, some, in some senses. Uh, of course, we know that some people uh, have desired to do other things, but um, but even as Christians, even as uh, particularly holiness people, people who believe uh, that we ought to live in particular ways, that we ought to be obedient, that we ought to be loving, and that we ought to be Christ-like, um, we oftentimes struggle to have Christ-like attitudes, words, and actions. And so what would free us to choose differently? Well, we all know and we've all seen people who maybe have had uh, claimed to have religious experiences or uh, they've, they claim to be saved, they claim to be sanctified, but their attitudes and their actions are not uh, reflecting of that. Jesus said that we will know a tree by its fruits. And we sometimes look at people who've had these experiences and we don't see the fruits. We also know people who go to church their entire lives who uh, go to Sunday school, who put money in the plate, who uh, go to every, meet, uh, every committee meeting, who sign up for every ministry, and, uh, and yet their life struggles to reflect a Christ-like attitude. They're invested in the church, but it seems like uh, this, uh, these attitudes, actions, and words uh, that, that are reflective of Jesus uh, seem to struggle to be there. And we can always point our fingers at other people, but the truth is we all know that there have been times where we have compromised. We have not been faithful. We did not express a Christ-like attitude or words or actions. It's really easy to point your finger at other people, but oftentimes that finger comes right back at our own selves. So the question then is, if this is the call of Christ. If we're supposed to live this way, if people who have religious experiences struggle to do this, if, if people who, um, who come to church all the time struggle to do this, and if you and I struggle to do this, then is just this holiness thing a cruel joke? Something that maybe Jesus taught to let us know that there's no way anybody ever would measure up to this. Well, I am of the opinion that Jesus wasn't kidding. <laughs> when he said that we ought to live in these ways. And so um, we as Christians uh, for a long time have been struggling to how do we embody these Christ-like attitudes, actions, and words. The earliest and probably a, 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 a certain philosophy or method that's gone all the way back to Plato says that reason alone provides the capacity for self-determination. Reason alone provides the capacity for self-determination. You just have to have the right thoughts. You just have to have the, the right kind of thinking, the logical kind of thinking, and that these things, this logical thinking, is going to somehow tame those affections and passions, those emotions and desires within our hearts, those emotional reactions and instincts that are always there. And if we can just be smart enough, and if we can just grit and bear hard enough, then we can control those things. A truly moral choice means subjugating our passions and our uh, to our rational control. Regular practice of this increases our capacity for moral and holy living. So if we just do this often enough, we'll get good at it. Well, I often, I often think of this as, how many of y'all been to a rodeo? You ever been to a rodeo? I love rodeos. Um, 
So you might think of it as, uh, say, uh, a, a calf roping. You ever seen calf roping? Ever, anybody ever done calf roping before? Some of you? Uh, so so, you, uh, so you, your reason is like the roper who's, who's going and is going to throw that rope around that calf who's like your emotions, who's just going crazy. And your reason's going to rip that thing down and, and get off. And oh, Man, I, can, I don't even know how they get down so fast. And they, they do it like that. And that's how, that's how we're going to uh, subdue our affections, our desires. You know, those pesky things that get in the way of making good moral choices. Or maybe it's like bull riding. You know, you get on this, uh, this big bull. I talked about that a couple weeks ago, named Fu Manchu. Um, and, uh, and you try to ride him for eight seconds. And, uh, and then if that rider is just skilled enough and strong enough and uh, maybe even lucky enough, he can stay on. Or really like barrel racing. You know, your emotions are like that horse, ready to go. Your, your passions, your desires, it is the motivating factor that's going to get you around those barrels. But that rider sure has to have control of that horse. And that's how this works in, uh, for a long time. And a young Wesley believed this for a long time about holiness. He believed that right thought would create right action and right affections, and they would all be controlled by this inspired rational will. That the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we have this inspired rational will that's going to control these behaviors and these passions. And that being holy is simply about willful obedience which battles the passions. You see here, uh, Susanna Wesley, his mom, taught that this is where Satan hangs out. Right here, in these right passions. He hangs out and he fights us in these moral dispositions. And she wrote several letters to, to her sons talking about this. And so Wesley said, really, we've, this, this inspired reason is going to, to give us the right action. It's going to let us do what we always want to do. It's going to help us have those Christ-like attitudes, actions, and behaviors that we ought to have. It's going to free us to do that. Well, um. I have a clip that's going to illustrate how this works. And so it's about a woman who goes to a psychologist. So let's, let's take a look at how this, this philosophy will help this woman deal with her problems. Go. <laughs> Go. Can you turn that video up for us? Well, tell, me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well... I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes, yes, that's it. All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most We find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, IT. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that... Sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> it is. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since childhood. No, no, childhood. no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. 
so I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. Well, it's only been it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Well, I, I only have a five, so. Well, I I don't I don't make change. <laughs> then I I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew, uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! <laughs> Not of some kind. Don't don't do that. But I, I'm compelled to. My mom used to call me. No, fatty. no, no, no. No, we we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. <laughs> just, just stop it. What, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> don't be such a big baby. I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. It is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! How, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! What's, what's the problem, Kathy? I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And and you and you don't you don't like that. No, I don't. So you think we're we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me uh, let me uh, give you 10 words that I I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you want to get a pad and a pencil for this one? <clears throat> Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box! Okay, so what if I told you that virtues were simply crafted by your pastor just looking at you and saying, Stop it! Do you think that would work? Probably not. You don't even listen to me when I make announcements. Um, okay. So what I find is that we're not the first people to go, maybe this doesn't work. In fact, Augustine knew it wasn't that simple. He says, reason cannot thwart affections and is more a slave to the passions than it is the master. So if we think that we could just reason our way or somehow grit and bear down and make the decision to stop it, that somehow that's going to make us more virtuous or that's going to help us make, become more Christ-like. He says, look, your reason is probably a whole lot more of a slave to your passions and desires than your passions and desires are a slave to your thinking. He says, because of the fall, all humans have bent affections and that only gives rise to sinful actions. That nothing but the regeneration offered by God and salvation can remove these bent affections. And we would say, amen, absolutely. But here's what he says. He says, holy living, it's somewhat possible, but compromised by our present age. We just, you know, you can try, but you're probably not going to get there. Well, the Bible talks about this tension that we all know exists inside us and describes as it describes how God's law affects us. So here's what Paul says in Romans. He says, I don't really understand myself. How many of you said amen? That's like the first thing you can amen here today. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that I am doing, what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. Now, here's what he's saying. Paul isn't just talking about himself. He's talking about all of Israel who continues to unwillingly sin. 
the destructive evil force, that sin, is using God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Faithful Israel wants to do what is good, but the good law is powerless to stop them from doing those things that they don't want to do. And enabling them, uh, it cannot enable them to live a holy life. So then he goes on, he says, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Try that in a court. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but, but I can't. And I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it or doing wrong. It is sin that lives in me that does it. The problem is not that God's law is not good. The problem is that the shadow law of the sinful nature is in God's people. Sin is to be blamed for the fleshly state of people. This is the heart of the problem. In order to do good, there must be a power within to accomplish it. And there has not been in Israel. Paul, like Augustine, believes that this power is provided by God in the work of Christ and the Spirit. So he goes on later and he says this. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what the sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if you live through the power of the Spirit, you'll you'll put to death the deeds of the sinful nature. You will live, for all who are led by the Spirit are of the children of God. Paul never tells us how or even when this happens. He just says it does. That the work of Christ and the power of the Spirit thwart the power of sin in your life and mine, our sinful nature, our actions, and our desires which lead to death. So the question remains, are we stuck in between of a sinful and regenerated nature, like Augustine said, or are we to simply trust that God's grace will get us there at some point? Is reason the place where God eradicates this sinful affection? You know, is God going to use our brain to kind of overcome these, these things? Or um, are we, with God's help, going to do battle between the heart and the mind? How, How does this work? Paul says that it does. Paul says, look, everybody has this sinful nature, but guess what? If you live in the power of the Spirit, you don't have to live. But he doesn't tell us how this works or when this happens. And Augustine says, well, it certainly doesn't happen before you die. You know, you'll you'll just kind of limp along until you get there and you just trust God's grace. So this does, does this really help us with the question, how do we have more Christ-like attitude, behaviors, and actions? How do we become more virtuous people, the kind of people that we want to do? How can we live in the power of the Spirit? Well, I want to say this. Something changed in Wesley as he got older. Wesley's connection with the Moravians gave him doubt in the ability of rational conviction alone to change human action. And this is where it happens. It happens as he's going over to the the Americas. He is on a boat in the bottom, and they are going down to Georgia. Um, That's where he's going to do his ministry over there. And at that point, a hurricane comes up, and the boat is being tossed to and fro. And Wesley, who is an Oxford don, studied theology. His mom is Susanna Wesley, like the super saint of the world. Um, His dad was a minister. His grandfathers were ministers. This guy knows Jesus. He knows the church. And he is having what they call in the South a conniption fit. He is having real doubts and problems. And he looks over and the Moravians are singing about God's love and grace. And there's a peace and happiness on there. And he begins to talk to these people. And this is where Wesley has some serious doubt about how rational conviction alone can change human action. So what more is needed? Well, at Aldersgate, Wesley's focus was sharpened on feeling God's love for him. 
he, he was reading the preface uh, of the book of Romans that Luther, Martin Luther had written. And in it, he talks about how his heart became strangely warmed. Not because he was thinking about his love for God, but because he was, uh, he, he was awe-inspired and struck by God's love for him. He came to believe that rational persuasion cannot overcome or heal one bad affection or passion. He says, we are only able to love others as we experience being loved by God ourselves. It's not the right idea that's going to make you a better person. It's not the logic that's going to make you a better person. It is experiencing God's love. And if, I, if you were to walk away and you, you, you're like, he showed us a Bob Newhart video and talked about Wesley. I don't, know what, I don't know what he's saying. If you're to walk away with one thing, I want you to know this, is that holiness and Christian virtuous living is not about producing, it is about receiving. And you say, Tim, but shouldn't we know a tree by its fruits? Absolutely. But you want to know how to bear those fruits? It's not you grit and you make the right choice. It happens as you get closer and experience the love of God. And God's love changes your affections. How does that happen? Well, Wesley develops this holistic, excuse me, holistic model of human volition, that is will. And this is what he says. He says it's not like Plato, if we go back here real quick, um, um, it's not like Plato, you know, the, the charioteer with the, two, with the two horses, that reason is trying to somehow control affections and passions and our emotions. No, he says it looks like this. He says you have these things inside of you. He said, of course you have thoughts. These are rational ideas that are behind your motivation. He said, but you have really these affections in your life. That you can have the right ideas about stuff, but your heart has these affections This way of being in the world that's been crafted and shaped, and if you use modern psychology, been crafted and shaped by all kinds of experiences that you've had. And you have these affections, and these affections are responsive, motivating inclinations behind every action. He believed that because we were created in the image of God, we have the capacity to have good relationships with other people and with him. Now, that capacity is only enabled by the power of the Spirit, and that's really important but that within us we have these affections. And these affections must be plucked like a string on a piano or on a guitar or a violin. They must be played by the love of God and they begin to resonate in response to that love. He says thoughts are not enough. These affections are the things that really drive your behavior. And so these are the things that are acted on by the love of God and they become wellsprings for good relationships in your life. And then these affections don't have to just be things that like one single note that's plucked. It can become an overture. It can become something that's tempered into an enduring character or disposition. That these affections don't have to just go away, but they can actually be crafted like a blacksmith hammers out and tempers out metal. And these tempers and affections and thoughts all work together inside the human life to create love. To enable us to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love our neighbor as ourself. You see... um, Wesley believed the will was not just a conduit of reason, but a set of affections that incite us to action. He rejected determinism like Augustine who said, well, we're just kind of, uh, yeah, God's, God's going to um, change our heart a little bit, but, uh, but he rejected a determinism and said that even though we can't generate love within ourselves, he said we can certainly stop it. 
Even though we cannot generate love because that love must come first from God, which comes from John. I don't know if you've ever read 1 John. We love God because why? He first loved us. And so this love begins to evoke a response of, a, of our affections in our life, and then we begin to do that. Now, you can stop that. He says you're not absolutely required to resonate with that. You can stop it like a, like a hammer dulcimer or something. Put it, rest it right on top of there. He also think, didn't think that affections had to just come and go. Again, they could be tempered. That the heart is where the will and the affections and the tempers all converge. And this, he says, is why Christianity is a heart religion. It's not simply a religion of affirmation of a certain belief, although it includes that. All of that is being wrapped up inside the human being. He had a much more holistic understanding of how human beings worked. So what does this mean about our dilemma of being holy and virtuous people. How does Wesley help, help us understand how we can be more holy, more virtuous, how we can have Christ-like attitudes, actions, and words? Well, he says that our actions and words, um, that, that uh, they flow from a corrupted temper or a sinful nature. So the problem of sin must be addressed at a heart level. Did you know that? You can't just know that you're a sinner. There is the problem of sin within you. You must be convicted deep in your heart that you need God. He says it has to be addressed at a heart level. You have to become so disgusted with the sin in your life. He says, what are the the means then if, if the problem of sin is addressed at a heart level, also that means that holiness is addressed at a heart level. That it's addressed as we get closer and closer and we hear and experience and, and feel the love that God has for us. Again, remember, holiness isn't about being producers, it's about being receivers. So what does it mean to seek a tempered heart a heart that the, the, the affections are being hammered out or being uh, wo- uh, woven into this overture of, of beauty and virtue. What does it mean? How do, we, how do we do this? If it's not, find the right idea, tame the emotions, get the right desires, and then we'll be virtuous people. What does it look like? Well, Wesley says it begins by feeling it. Again, at Aldersgate, this change of heart. He says, my heart was strangely warmed that he sensed God's love for him. Do you know that God loves you? And I don't mean know in the regular English sense like knowledge. You have a knowledge of God's love for you. Have you experienced God's love for you? He says, this is where it begins. As we experience God's acceptance of the sinner, it begins to resonate in the affections of our hearts. Now you say, Tim, don't you have to have the right idea about God to do that? Absolutely. But again, this is not about bifurcating or trifurcating or quadrufacating. That's not a word. Okay. Um, All of the parts of the human being, it recognizes that we are one whole thing. God doesn't save just a part of you. But the question fundamentally is where does the, the, the virtue and the, the, the hope and where does the love of God begin? And it begins, Wesley says, not in the mind but in the affections. So you have to feel it. Then he says we have to respond to it. He says, you are, or Paul says, you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit and if you, have the spi- uh, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. So if the Spirit of God is living within you, you don't have to live out those sinful, tempered, natured desires within you. The Spirit of God can free you, can begin to move in, in uh, powerful ways in your life, and, and you can begin to respond 
to the activity of the Spirit in your life. The presence of the Spirit in your life enlivens our liberty so that our sinful tempers do not have to reign. Otherwise, you're stuck. And I want to make sure you understand that because what Wesley is not saying is this. Well, if you just have some good fuzzy feelings, then you know God saved you. That's not what he's saying at all. He doesn't talk about emotions for emotion's sake. He says emotions are the place where God's love begins to resonate and then it begins to filter into all aspects of our life. He says respond to it so that you have the ability, the Holy Spirit who comes within you gives you the ability to respond, but you have to experience the presence of God first before you can respond. Then he, sa- uh, he says, let God wake it up. Let God wake that thing up within you. For the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Here's, here's how we often interpret that. Oh, that's the gifts of the Spirit. Like the Spirit comes into our lives and He gives us love and joy and peace like a present. But that's not how this works in the passage. The fruit of the presence of the Spirit in our life is that the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, the patience that God has, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, these things begin to resonate within our hearts and the this Holy Spirit is plucking the cords of our life and we are responding to the love of God and he is waking up these virtues within, within us. He says, let God wake those things up within you. And then he says, we must temper them, temper it. Now, for us, when we think of temper, we think of, you know, a kid who's having a temper tantrum. That's not what he's meaning. He's meaning to temper it, to like, like a blacksmith who's hammering out uh, metal. He says, through the means of grace, tempers are both exercised and formed. Exercised and formed. Through the means of grace, tempers are both exercised and formed. You want to know how to temper those affections that the Holy Spirit is animating within you? You need to participate, he says, in the means of grace. Now, I want you to understand something. Have you noticed that I didn't say that we do anything in these things? We're always responding to God because holiness and Christian virtue is not about production, it's about reception. We respond to God in the action that he takes. And so we begin to temper it by presenting ourselves to God in the means of grace. The various means of grace, prayer, liturgy, Eucharist, class meetings, love, he calls them love feasts, we call them like dinners, Um, uh, works of mercy, visiting the poor. All of these are not simply an exercise of Christian virtue. You might think, oh, that's, that's how we exercise our, that's the, how we demonstrate the fruit. That's not just the exercise that he says that when you actually do these things, those affections are being tempered and turned into lasting dispositions in your life. That we ha- as we continue to do these, our lives become, those affections become solid virtue Uh, virtues formed in our life. So the goal of Wesley's heart religion was Christian perfection. And this is what he meant by that. The humble, gentle, patient love of God and our neighbor, ruling our tempers, words, and actions. This is the goal of that heart religion, of experiencing and encountering God of feeling it, responding to it, allowing God to wake it up, and tempering it through the means of grace. The Christian life does not have to remain a perpetual struggle, but can, through gracious transformation, be freed to truly love consistently. To deny this is to deny the sufficiency of God's grace. What that means is we make sin greater than grace. So this virtue challenge, what is this? So, you, so many of you got a little uh, journal when you walked in here. And this is a part of that. 
uh, virtue challenge, and I want to encourage you guys to participate in this. And what we're going to focus on over the next, uh, this week and the next six weeks, uh, it, are these six virtues. And these six virtues are gratitude, empathy, compassion, trust, mindfulness, and forgiveness. These particular virtues were chosen uh, because they are both rooted in the Bible as well as the science of virtue ethic, which have a uh, and they say that these things have significant impact on our human relationships. Because uh, essentially and ultimately, where your virtues are exercised are in your relationships. So you want to have better relationships? These are some of the virtues that we're going to have to learn to temper. And how do we temper them? Well, that's what your, these exercises are, are done. Now, again, remember, it's not about producing. It's not about, I'm going to write this journal. I'm going to go through these exercises. And when I do, I'm going to be a better person. You need God. <laughs> you can't do this without him. And that's the difference between this and virtue science, is that we say it doesn't matter how much effort and energy and, and time that you put into this without the presence of the loving God, because we, we cannot love unless we are first loved by God. So, each week, you'll get a chance to journal, which uh, has some exercises that you can use as devotionals to help you open yourself up to the love of God. Now, I've gone through these before, and I will say, some of these, some of these exercises seem silly, and you're going to find yourself arguing with them. Do them anyway. Do them anyway. I'm not going to do that. Do them anyway. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you 10 minutes of your day, and I would just encourage you that some of them, while they might seem silly, you might find that these things are going to open up doors in your heart that have been closed for quite some time. Um, so you'll, there'll be some exercises they're important for the process. It's also important that you have a group. Now, I'm not going to force you to get into a group. I'm not going to mandate it. I couldn't do that anyway. I can't tell you to stop it. I can't direct your virtue life. I can't even, uh, I, I can't even tell you all the details of what's going on in the church. <laughs> I, I, I can't force you to do any of this. And I don't want to. But I would encourage you to find a group. Uh, to process your experience over these next six weeks. Find two to three people that you trust to have coffee or maybe spend an hour together to process your experience once a week. They can be your family, your friends, a small group, a Sunday school class, or maybe two to three friends that you choose. They don't even have to attend this church. If you want to get a journal for them and ask them to walk, you through, walk through it with you, do that. Um. Just meet consistently, and there's a little group discussion guide that, that is provided. And ask those questions. So find a group. Because one of the things that they find is that when you have to process this with somebody else, it actually becomes real. It's not just an activity on a page. You have to begin to process the way in which you're experiencing God. Okay. Okay. Then finally, if you have questions, you can feel free to contact me. If you're willing to share, I would love to hear a report at the end of the Virtue Challenge. And you can send me an email. You can type me a letter. You can set up a meeting to share your experience. I would love to hear how God has used seven weeks to show you his love. Even if it's a negative report, even if you want to sit there and say, those were the dumbest exercises I've ever seen in my life. I will never do anything like this again. And you smell, sir. <laughs> I'll say, fantastic. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, so I, I, I want to hear about that. Maybe you went through something and it was, it was negative. It was hard for you. You didn't understand it. Maybe you just struggled with it or maybe you thought it was silly. I'd love to hear those, those things. So I'd encourage you to uh, provide or, or give me a report if you can. Um, and I also want you to understand that I didn't write these. 
These are de- have been developed by um, uh, oh, Michael, uh, oh, he's a psychologist at Point Loma um, who works uh, heavily with the University of Chicago, uh, their, their psychology department in the development of virtue ethics. And um, so they were developed by him as well as some theologians uh, who kind of helped walk through some of the scriptural things. And, um, and so I would encourage you uh, to, to use these. These are great resources that corporations pay thousands of dollars to utilize, and we've been given them for free by a Lilith grant. For the uh, uh, Center for Pastoral Le- Leadership received a, uh, a Lil- 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 Lilith? I don't know how you say it. Lilith grant um, for, for about 4 or $5 million to do this project. And so we are receiving all of this, this stuff for free. Um, so I'd encourage you to take advantage of it. But I, my hope is, is that when you get to the end of this, one, you sense God in places where you haven't sensed him before. That as you open your life to God's love, that you sense him in your gratitude and in, your emp- in the way in which you see other people, your empathy. In the way mindfulness really is about how you, how you process your own thoughts, how, how, how you're aware, self-aware of, uh, of, of how you're thinking. Um, and uh, even things like forgiveness. Maybe some people have been holding back forgiveness for, for a long time. And this, these exercises might help you begin to, to walk through that. So, um, but before uh, we leave this, and I'm going to invite our praise team to come up because we're going to sing a song. But before I, I finish, I want to say a prayer, but I want to say this. You cannot go on this journey alone. If, even if you don't have a group, you still need God. <laughs> And if, if, if you walk out of here and you think that somehow doing these exercises is going to make you a more virtuous person without the love of God, you're going to miss it. And you're just going to walk away frustrated. Open your life up to God. Let him draw you close in this time. Stand with us and let's just make that our declaration and our prayer.